Hello folks, I am Adam for today's news. I will be reading and speaking about world news, interesting news, news to keep you entertained, and news to keep you informed. First thing I got for you from uh, Benzinga. Kim Jong-un mouthpiece slams South Korea, U, slams U.S. South Korea summit. May trigger worst ever nuclear war. See what it says. North Korea on Sunday slammed the U.S.-South Korea's nuclear deterrence agreement for escalating tension to the brink of a nuclear war. What happened? Kim Jong-un's mouthpiece, citing an international security analyst, said the agreement stipulated Washington and Seoul's puppet hooligans' willingness to take the most hostile and aggressive action against Pyongyang. The placement of U.S. strategic assets has created an unstable situation in the Korean peninsula and was designed to establish aggressive and exclusive military blocs, KCNA reported. It is just aimed to dodge the responsibility for the worst-ever nuclear-related crimes it has committed by systematically destroying and violating the nuclear non-proliferation system, and in particular, pushing the situation of the Korean Peninsula to the brink of a nuclear war, it said. It is the hegemonic sinister aim pursued by the U.S. to turn the whole of South Korea into its biggest nuclear war outpost in the Far East and effectively use it for attaining its strategy for dominating the world. Why it matters, in a meeting held last week in Washington, the two allies, the U.S. and South Korea reached a series of strategic agreements on extended deterrence against North Korea's unprecedented missile tests. President Joe Biden-led administration's new nuclear deterrence effort calls for periodically docking U.S. nuclear-armed submarines in South Korea for the first time in decades. Kim's powerful sister has also opposed the decision and vowed additional military demonstrations in response to the pact. Pyongyang has long opposed the joint exercises on the pretext that they serve as rehearsals for an invasion. And that's all I got on that one there. Let me go to the next one here. This is from 1945. Putin's uh, game of chicken. Is Russia trying to start a war with America? Is Russia trying to start a war with the United States? Military pilots are likely to spend their whole careers training for aerial combat, only to never have the chance actually to put their skills to the test. That should be seen as a good thing, but Russian pilots are actively trying to engage in dogfights with the US in the skies over Syria. What is Russia doing? According to a report from the Wall Street Journal last week, armed Russian warplanes have repeatedly violated long-standing agreements with the U.S. by flying dangerously close to American jet fighters as well as over U.S. forces on the ground. In addition, drones have been harassing U.S. forces with increasing frequency, creating new risks of a deadly miscalculation between the two military superpowers the paper of record noted. Since the beginning of March, Russian jets have been noted to have violated deconfliction protocols at least 85 times, including 26 instances where the Kremlin's aircraft flew too close to coalition bases and troops in Syria. Around 900 U.S. personnel are currently in Syria to advise and assist the patchwork of rebel forces that are now fighting the government forces. In addition, the Pentagon continues to launch airstrikes and raids throughout the Middle East region as part of its now decade-long mission to contain the Islamic State group. Moscow backs the Syrian government's efforts to suppress anti-government rebels. For those reasons, the U.S. and Russian military officials communicate regularly on a deconfliction telephone, which allows for the sharing of details about planned missions including aircraft call signs and planes' electronic transmission codes. This goal is to make sure U.S. and Russian aircraft don't engage one another. Baiting the U.S. into war? Based on the recent reports, it almost seems that the Russians would like a chance to dogfight U.S. fighters. Russian pilots have been increasingly bellicose in how they're approaching us, Lt. Gen. Alexis Grinkwich, head of the Air Force's Central Command, said in an interview with Marcus Wiesgerber of Defense One on Thursday.
They're maneuvering aggressively against us when our protocols would say we're supposed to stay several miles apart and just monitor each other. Grinkwich added, they're aggressively maneuvering, almost like they're trying to dogfight, if you will. That's very concerning. There have already been more than close calls. In March, a United States Air Force MQ-9 Reaper surveillance drone was forced down over the Black Sea after the unmanned aerial vehicle, UAV, was struck by a Russian Sukhoi Su-27 NATO reporting name flanker, fighter jet. Air Force officials called the actions by the Russian pilots unsafe and unprofessional, and warned that it could have caused both aircraft to crash. The Kremlin subsequently presented state awards to the pilots of the Russian jets. The same month, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov drew laughter from a crowd in India when he tried to make the claim that Russia's invasion of Ukraine was actually launched against his nation. He has further made outlandish statements that NATO aggression is what is now behind the war in Ukraine. Perhaps the pilots actually believe those statements and believe a war with the West is already underway. If that is the case, it could make for very dangerous skies any time U.S. and Russian must share it. And that's all I got on that one there. Let me go to the next one here. They're from uh, Ukrainska uh, Pravda. Russian-speaking residents in Riga call on Putin not to protect them. After a Russian state uh, Duma statement. Several dozens of Russian-speaking residents of Latvia on April 29 held a rally near the Russian embassy in Riga calling on Russia not to protect them. Source, Latvian news websites Delphi and LRT, reports European Pravda. Details, the rally was organized by the Russian Voice for Latvia Union. The impetus for the meeting was the statement of the State Duma of the Russian Federation on the inadmissibility of the repressive policy of the leadership of the Baltic states towards the Russian-speaking population. Grandfather, take pills photo, Delphi. People gathered near the Russian embassy in Riga around 1400 hours with slogans against Moscow's interference in Latvia's internal affairs and the use of the country's Russian-speaking residents in the interests of Russia. The participants of the action unfurled the poster Grandfather, Take Pills, people also brought the flags of the EU and Ukraine and handmade posters with the slogans We Need Europe, Not the Russian Peace, Latvia is the Motherland, Russia is the Occupier, Don't Poke Your Nose into Latvia, Get Your Hands Off Our Country. We Need Europe, Not the Russian Peace Photo, Delphi. Don't Poke Your Nose into Latvia Photo, Delphi. Martin Levushkin, head of the organization, explained that they want to convey the position of those Russian-speaking Latvians who oppose Moscow's policy towards the Baltic states and are outraged that the Russian Federation uses them for its political purposes and division in society. We don't need to be protected, protect yourself in The Hague. Our homeland is Latvia, he concluded. Photo, Delphi One provocateur approached the participants, but overall the rally passed without incident. Background, the Saima of Latvia granted Russians additional time for the language exam, which is a condition for a residence permit. Meanwhile, surveys have shown that for the first time in the history of observations, Latvian Russian speakers consider the country's foreign policy orientation to the West more desirable than to the East. Uh, you see this? There's one person here holding this uh, this uh, sign with this picture here, Putin, Hussein, and Hitler. They're putting it all together. Let's go to the next one. This is from 1945. North Korea tried to kill the uh, Mach 3 SR-71 spy plane. Throughout the Cold War, the United States Air Force's State Route 71 was one of the world's fastest and highest-flying operational aircraft. From 80,000 feet in the air, it could survey 100,000 square miles of the Earth's surface per hour. Developed by Lockheed Skunk Works in Burbank, California, the aircraft, which was unofficially known as the Blackbird, 
was so fast that it could outrun an adversary's surface-to-air missile, SAM. Moreover, the aircraft's use of composite materials, including a mixture of asbestos and epoxy, provided high temperature resistance but also provided radar-absorbent characteristics that helped reduce the Blackbird's radar cross-section, RCS. Not a single State Route 71 was lost or even damaged due to hostile action in part because its combination of speed, altitude, and RCS made for a difficult target to track. However, that didn't mean that there weren't attempts to try to shoot it down. North Korea vs. State Route 71, who wins? On August 27, 1981 a story appeared in the New York Times, Missile is fired by North Koreans at U.S. spy plane near the DMZ. As the story reported, a day earlier the North Koreans did try in vain to shoot down an aircraft that likely few Americans had ever even heard of at that point. More interesting perhaps than the fact that the plane was targeted was that the newspaper of record was able to share such detailed information about the aircraft at the time. Buried on page 12 of the national edition of the paper, it likely wasn't even seen as a big deal at the time. Rather than being a repeat of the U-2 incident from 1960 in which the Soviet Union's air defense forces successfully shot down an American spy plane, the North Koreans didn't even come close. Moreover, it shouldn't have been a surprise that the Pyongyang took its shot. The North Korean regime of Kim Il-sung had protested flights of the State Route 71 over its territorial waters. In the months prior to the attempted targeting of the Blackbird, North Korea had claimed that the United States had conducted 19 prior spy missions. As the newspaper and other outlets reported at the time, the missile fire did not come near the target, while the Pentagon only said that the pilot saw a missile vapor trail that was several miles from the aircraft. In the years since the incident, a few details have emerged. Pilot Maury Rosenberg and co-pilot Ed McKinn had been making their third pass over the DMZ and reportedly saw the rising plume of a missile. Rosenberg remained calm but banked the aircraft away from North Korea. The high speed ensured that the crew escaped without a scratch. AviationGeekClub.com also suggested that North Korea may have fired two, not one, Soviet SA-2 SAMs, also known as the S-75 Dvina. It was the same type of missile platform that was used in 1960 to shoot down the U-2 flown by Francis Gary Powers. However, the North Koreans failed to hit their target with the missile. It wasn't a matter of bad luck, but was rather that the Blackbird did exactly what it was designed to do, outrun anything the enemy could throw at it. And that's all I got on that one there. And my AI is not reading this correctly. It says State Route 71 is actually SR-71, not State Route. I must ap apologize for my AI. <laughs> Let me go to the next one. This is from Reuters. U.S. Appeals Court Strikes Ban on Bump Stocks. January 6th, Reuters. A U.S. appeals court on Friday struck down a rule the Trump administration had adopted following a 2017 Las Vegas mass shooting that banned bump stocks, devices that allow people to rapidly fire multiple rounds from semi-automatic guns. In a 13-3 decision, the New Orleans-based Fifth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals said that despite tremendous public pressure to impose a ban, it was up to the U.S. Congress rather than the president to take action. Advertisement scroll to continue. While the Federal Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, ATF, and Explosives had interpreted a law banning machine guns as extending to bump stocks, U.S. Circuit Judge Jennifer Walker Elrod said the law did not unambiguously prohibit them. Elrod, writing for the majority, said the law also did not give fair warning that possession of a non-mechanical bump stock is a crime. One of the dissenting judges, Stephen Higginson, wrote that the majority employed reasoning to legalize an instrument of mass murder. Three other federal appeals courts have rejected challenges to the ban. 
While the Supreme Court in October declined to hear appeals from two of the earlier decisions, Friday's ruling raises the prospect the court could eventually decide the issue. The resulting circuit split should bring this decision to the U.S. Supreme Court's attention promptly and supply a suitable vehicle for deciding this issue once and for all, said Mark Chenoweth, the president of the New Civil Liberties Alliance, a conservative group that litigated the case. ATF, the arm of the Justice Department that adopted the rule, declined to comment. A bump stock lets a gun stock, which rests against the shoulder, slide backward and forward letting users take advantage of the gun's recoil to fire rapidly. Though gun restrictions are often championed by Democrats, former President Donald Trump's Republican administration imposed the ban on bump stocks through an ATF rule after a gunman used them in killing 58 people at an October 2017 country music concert in Las Vegas. Democratic President Joe Biden's administration also supports the ban, which took effect in 2019. In December 2021, a three-judge Fifth Circuit panel had upheld the ban, ruling against Texas gun owner Michael Cargill, who opposed it. Friday's decision reversed that ruling. Most of the judges in the majority were appointed by Republican presidents, while the dissenting judges were appointed by Democratic presidents. presidents. And that's all I got on that one there. I just ran into something about bump stocks and they're going to be interesting. Let me go to the next one here. It's from Reuters. This dated August 25th, 2023. Another uh, appeals court rules against U.S. ban on gun bump stock. Judges rule statute on machine guns is ambiguous. Court joins Fifth Circuit in striking down ban as administration appeals to Supreme Court. Reuters, a second federal appeals court has struck down a nationwide ban on so-called bump stocks, devices that allow semi-automatic weapons to rapidly fire multiple rounds like machine guns. Advertisement scroll to continue. A three-judge panel of the 6th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals in Cincinnati, Ohio, on Tuesday sided with a Kentucky man who had sued to challenge the rule in 2019. The court said that the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives, ATF, went beyond its legal authority when it banned the devices by classifying them as machine gun parts in 2017. The New Orleans-based Fifth Circuit already struck down the ban in a separate case in January. President Joe Biden's administration has asked the U.S. Supreme Court to hear its appeal of that decision, saying it threatens significant harm to public safety. We are happy with this decision and hope the ATF recognizes its duty to abide by the law as written, instead of unilaterally replacing statutory definitions with agency-created definitions, which wrongfully criminalize legal conduct," said Alan Cobb, a lawyer for the plaintiff, Louisville anesthesiologist Scott Harden. ATF declined to comment. The ban was enacted under former President Donald Trump in response to a deadly mass shooting in Las Vegas in which the shooter used guns equipped with bump stocks to kill 58 people and wound hundreds more. Bump stocks use a semi-automatic's recoil to allow it to slide backwards and forwards while bumping the shooter's trigger finger, resulting in rapid fire. ATF determined in 2017 that the devices, which had previously been allowed, were machine guns under the National Firearms Act of 1934. Federal law prohibits the sale or possession of machine guns, punishable by up to 10 years in prison. Hardin claimed in his lawsuit that the rule went beyond ATF's authority. U.S. District Judge David Hale disagreed, ruling in favor of the agency. Sixth Circuit Judge Ronald Lee Gilman wrote Tuesday that the 1934 law must be interpreted according to the rule of lenity, which requires ambiguity in a criminal statute to be resolved in criminal defendants' favor. Because the relevant statutory scheme does not clearly and unambiguously prohibit bump stocks, we are bound to construe the statute in Hardin's favor, the judge wrote. Circuit Judge David McKeague joined in the opinion. Circuit Judge John Bush wrote in a separate concurring opinion that the federal law was not ambiguous and clearly did not cover bump stocks.
The case is Hardin v. Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives et al., 6th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals, No. 20 to 6380. For Hardin, Jason Hardin of Hardin Law Group and Alan Cobb of Cobb Law. For the government, Brad Hinchelwood of the U.S. Department of Justice. Okay, and that's all I got on that one there. So from what I take of it, it's not, it's, it's not illegal to have them. And let me go to the next one here. This is from Newsweek. What might make uh, Joe Biden unelectable in a very scary threat? Opinion. I wrote a piece recently on how Florida Governor Ron DeSantis made himself unelectable by doing the politically foolish thing of changing his position on abortion, denying abortion access after six weeks or even earlier. Former President Donald Trump has also made himself increasingly unelectable as he does more and more to strengthen his hold on the Republican nomination. We hardly need more evidence than the recent Wisconsin Supreme Court race to see how even the most swing of swing states will go strongly for a Democratic candidate when there is a stark choice on abortion access, especially up against a Republican candidate who also embraces extremist views. We should ask the same question about Joe Biden, is there anything that might also make him unelectable? And while this question cannot be answered with quite the definitiveness that recent evidence suggests why both DeSantis and Trump are unelectable in a general election, there is clearly a developing issue that could deny Joe Biden re-election. The issue that could make Joe Biden unelectable is not in his control and is a far greater threat to his re-election than any single policy question. The threat is the effort to create a so-called unity, bipartisan ticket consisting of a moderate Democrat and a non-mega Republican to run as a third-party independent choice in all 50 states. The theory behind this initiative, driven by the centrist group, No Labels, has a well-meaning rationale, giving voters the third option in keeping with the fact that 41% or more of the electorate identifies as independent. The idea is that with Biden's approval rating not being much above 40%, and a wide majority of the country not wanting Biden or Trump to run again, that it would be possible for such a unity ticket to win the presidency. The history of third-party candidates in the United States is not one that would give any credence to the notion that a fusion ticket consisting of a Republican as president and Democrat as vice president, or vice versa, could win. No third-party candidate has won even one electoral college vote in the last 50 years. Even Teddy Roosevelt, an enormously popular national figure who after being president ran a third-party campaign under the Bull Moose Party did not come close. Roosevelt split the Republican vote, ending up with 88 electoral college votes, resulting in the presidency going to Democrat Woodrow Wilson. More recently, in 2000, Ralph Nader, running as the Green Party candidate, did not even get 3% of the national vote but the 97,000-plus votes he received in Florida were enough to give George W. Bush a 537-vote margin of victory when ballot counting was stopped that cost Al Gore the presidency. No labels indicates that it would only pull the trigger on actually holding what it says would be an April 2024 national convention, about six weeks after the Super Tuesday primaries if there appears to be a path to victory for an independent candidate who would draw voters equally from both parties. Much of the consideration by those organizing this effort has been focused on putting forward a slate just for the scenario that seems to be developing, if the two parties nominate Biden and Trump. No labels would no doubt point to the recent NBC News poll which indicates that 70% of the country, including over 50% of Democrats, do not want Biden to run again, and only 35% of the country want Trump to run again. Okay, I want to stop it there. There's a lot more to read there. Um, I'm going on to my last one here. This one here is uh, from Buzz Loving. Uh, this is what happens in communist nations, not the USA. Lauren Boebert unleashes fury on Democrats. Defends January 6. Lauren Boebert is one of the biggest Trump apologists. In a series of tweets, 
Bobert claimed that the potential arrest of the former president is a witch hunt and claimed that his arrest is the only thing that would give Democrats an advantage in the elections in 2024. The representative for Colorado's 3rd Congressional District shared some eyebrow-raising statements, and the most controversial has to be the one surrounding January 6. Her tweets came after a series of attacks against President Biden and his family. Bobert on January 6. Bobert shared a tweet, Never forget who these people truly are showing themselves to be. They want anyone who doesn't agree with them locked up. She concluded, first it was the J6 heirs. Today it is Trump. Tomorrow it could be you. The representative for Colorado's 3rd Congressional District statement came under fire. One person replied, the political movement you are part of literally chanted lock her up about a political opponent for years. Trump is being investigated by an independent judiciary. Sit down. More people came with personal questions, as a Twitter user asked, was that question on your GED you failed three times? Others reminded her that no one should be above the law. One person tweeted, no, Lauren, it is criminals that get locked up. Not innocent people. It is J6 planners and insurrectionists. You asked for a pardon, and it's not coming. You are not above the law. You sound very nervous, and I would be too if I were you, Lauren Boebert. Boebert goes after Hillary Clinton. Previously, the representative from Colorado called out Hillary Clinton. Boebert wrote, It is ridiculous that Hillary Clinton and others walk around without a care in the world while President Trump is put through hell on earth. It's been a clown show for at least six years, 32 things we once highly respected but are a complete joke now. Full screen. S among Republicans who hold Clinton, the former Secretary of State, accountable for the deadly September 11, 2012, attack on U.S. government facilities in Benghazi, Libya. She added, the Democrats know they won't be able to beat our ideas at the ballot box in 2024 so think this is their only hope. Like in all the controversial tweets the mom of four shared, people had different opinions. One person wrote, the justice system is now rigged to reward criminals and target people who go against the woke system. Another, however, asked, imagine if Hillary Clinton had said when they attack me, they attack all of you when she was questioned by the House about Benghazi or about her email server. The Witch Hunt The grandmother-to-be shared, we're witnessing the most obscene political witch hunt in American history. Similarly to Marjorie Taylor Greene, Boebert wrote, the federal government has been weaponized against anyone who opposes the current regime. Are you paying attention yet? This is what happens in communist nations, not the USA. This viral tweet was also received with mixed reactions. One person replied, We get it, the rule of law doesn't matter to you. Another shared, says the dropout who asked for a pardon after giving a reconnaissance tour of the capital to domestic terrorists just days before they swarmed, overwhelmed and smashed their way into it as the nation watched live on TV. That doesn't happen in the USA. But it did. Needless to say, it will be exciting to see Boebert's Twitter feed if Trump gets charged next week. With over 2.3 million followers, the Colorado representative is one of the most followed politicians on Twitter. And uh, I, that's how I got on that one there. And uh, that one line they had there, where was it at? that innocent people don't get locked up. Innocent people does get locked up. You know, they have guys in prison 10, 20 years and uh, finally figure out that, you know, they locked up the wrong person or the person didn't do it. Yeah, right here it says, not innocent people. It says, uh, it is criminal that get locked up, not innocent people. That's a lie. That's definitely a lie. I hear on the news all the time how people get out of prison after 10, 20 years or so. And uh, 
they were wrongfully, I mean, wrongfully locked up. The justice system is, is terrible in the U.S. I know it's probably worse in other countries, but it's terrible in the U.S. Anyway, that's all I got for you for now. <clears throat> Remember, I am Alan for today's news. I will be reading and speaking about world news, interesting news, news to keep you entertained and new to keep you informed. And I uh, hope I got th something for you, 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 you know, you like to hear. And don't forget to like, subscribe, at least come back once in a while. And I thank you for watching. Later.